entrepreneurs from connecting and collaborating um, is trust. If you've never collaborated and saw the benefits of collaboration, then you don't know that you need to. If there is individuals who have strengths that you don't have um, and you complement each other, you have those thought par partners, those accountability partners that you really can work with well together, the outcome is just amazing. I have been in five collaboration books. Uh, one of the benefits for me is the time piece because when you're writing your own book, it does take time. Then secondly, you are opened up to so many more people than you would ever do by yourself. Just the benefit of expanding your reach and your circle is a, uh, also a benefit in collaboration. I really feel that every entrepreneur needs a book because it helps validate what you're doing. Um, you do the work, um, you are out there making money off of what you're doing. I like to know what it is that you're doing as an entrepreneur. Tell us your story. Everyone has a story. Um, which is why I highlight entrepreneurs in the Grind Entrepreneur Network because I am giving them a question of the day. They are detailing their questions and their responses and you're getting to know who that entrepreneur is. And so with a book, you're able to do that. Your audience, your clients, your customers, they're able to see who you are as a person and not just as that CEO or that boss that you are of your business. The mission of the Grind Entrepreneur Network is really quite simple. Um, it is to support, connect, develop, and highlight entrepreneurs. The network is just amazing. And so I'm really so glad for that because when I need services done, I go to my network to see who I can invest in. You know, I really want to do something to help support and highlight entrepreneurs who are on their grind. And, and that's really how the Grind Entrepreneur Network was born. So Perfect Time SHP, that is really a passion. Um, that is a coaching and consulting firm, and I um, really just focus on leadership development. Um, I look at uh, those career professionals, um, as well as entrepreneurs. If you are in need of a leadership development coach, um, if you just need some steps, some guidance, some how-tos on getting your uh, entrepreneur journey started, um, if you want to up-level your career, um, certainly reach out to me. Um, also, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to connect with others um, that are all across the United States and beyond, and also be highlighted and featured in our Grind Entrepreneur Network Spotlight each month, Definitely reach out to I'm Sharon H. Porter.com and I would love to connect and collaborate with you so that we can definitely support your efforts and make sure that you get the results that you want in your business. Happy, amazing Sunday to you all. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, host of the I Am Dr. Sharon Show. I am just elated to be with you today, and I must start out with a shout out for my sponsors, James Adele Custom Clothier at James Adele CC on Instagram and Facebook. That's where you will find extravagant fabrics and custom room tailing all at an affordable price. And also Clout Workspace in Capitol Heights, Maryland and Prince George's County. You will love to collaborate and network at Clout Workspace. You can find them on Instagram at GetClout. And today, I tell you, I have another dynamic lineup on the I Am Dr. Sharon show. We are going to start with my first guest, Dr. Brenda T. Bradley. Welcome, Brenda. How are Good you? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm well. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. And just a little bit of Dr. Bra about Dr. Bradley. She is a U.S service member of the Air Force for 15 years. Thank you, Dr. Bradley, for your service. She is also a certified health coach. She's an author, a speaker, and founder of the 21 Day Vegan Challenge. Awesome. We have Thank a you. lot to talk about this morning. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. welcome. Absolutely. So I first have to start out by 15 years in the Air Force. Yes. How awesome is that? It was absolutely wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, I come from a family of six, and I was the first one to join the military. My father and my mother just knew I was going to college, 
And I said, no, I'm going to do something different. So I joined the Air Force. And it was amazing. And even the opportunities that it provided me, I totally enjoyed it. And not only that, but you're sitting here looking at a tomboy. So I <laughs> knew that I had chosen the right profession at the time. That's so I awesome. truly enjoyed being in the Air Force. Very good. And so now you are a certified health coach. Ooh. That is loaded. Please tell us, because you know we're all about being healthy. And you have helped so many people do that. Yes. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, um, how this all came to be, I could not have told you or anyone that I would one day be a certified health coach. And what happened was my own personal struggles. So for a number of years after leaving the military, um, I found myself on a battlefield that was totally unrelated to the Air Force. And this particular battlefield I called obesity. Um, I, over the course of time, I gained weight. Um, no longer size 10, saw myself at a 12 or 14, 16, 18, no longer 160 pounds, but weighing in at 236 pounds. How did I get there? What was happening? What was going on? And then the scare came when my doctor says, listen, Brenda, you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, uh, you're dealing with depression, you are now pre-diabetic. Um, you have got to lose the weight. But the doctor never could tell me how to get it off. So over the course of years, up and down, yo, 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 I tried in and everything. I could have been a spokesperson for any weight loss program out there. Wow. I guaranteed you, you bring it, I already know about wow. it. And so it just came, got to a point that I just said, you know, um, what was happening to me? What, what am I doing here? So sitting in church, I'm thinking like, Maybe let me go to church, and I know I should feel good while I'm sitting in church and because I'm feeling terrible. I'm really, really terrible. And I sat there, and the minister started talking about Lent season, giving up something, making a sacrifice. And I had knew about um, plant-based lifestyles. I've heard about it. I didn't really know about it. And so I sat there, and I said, you know what? I have tried any and everything, so I'm going to give up meat for 40 days only. Wow. That's it. Coming from <laughs> Arkansas, that's not a conversation. We <laughs> ate everything. So after the 40 days, um, I had actually lost 33 pounds. Wow. I had given up all meat, um, no seafood, no eggs, no cheese, wow. no milk. I gave it up for 40 days, and I lost 33 pounds. And so I was so excited, and the energy was off the chart. Every day is a Saturday for me. Every day is a Saturday. So when I lost all the weight, and it kept coming off, it kept coming, and it was staying off. And I said, you know what, Lord? I need to put something together. There are so many people that are out there struggling, and they're trying in and everything, yes. and they really believe by going to the gym, that's all they have to do. That is not true. Wow. There's more to it. You got to take care of your temple. And I had to learn it the hard way. <laughs> wow. uh, but over the course of time, I said, wow, I really want to encourage others and motivate. I, I know I can do this, but I don't know what I'm doing. So that's what led me that pathway. Mm -hmm. So I went back to school to study about nutrition for over 13 months. I went to two schools. And um, then after that, I studied even more, and I became certified as a health coach. Wow. So that's what got me on the path to that. Wow, <laughs> that is really amazing. And so I really, this 21-day vegan challenge, you cannot be on Facebook and not know about this. <laughs> so really, and, and actually, I want to share this now because this, um, I feel good. This is really testimonies from people who were on the 21-day vegan challenge. Yes. Please talk to us about this challenge. Okay. So this 21-day uh, vegan challenge came, um, I, I, as I mentioned, I wanted to put something together to encourage, to help other people. I had no guideline, no guidance. No one was helping me. You know, I was making so many mistakes, and I didn't want that to happen to someone else. So I know that it takes 21 days to, to break a habit, to get you started. So I just said, oh, you know what, I'm going to put this program together. And what this program would consist of, this is not a program that is um, trying to turn anyone into a vegan. It is a program that is designed for anyone that wants to make a lifestyle change or for just individuals who wants to experience and explore the healthy benefits of a plant-based lifestyle. So with this 21-day challenge, I'm actually, every month for the last two years, I have been hosting this 21-day um, vegan challenge. This challenge consists of you get a 21-day meal plan, you get a copy of my cookbook, Kale, yeah, it's good, no meat necessary. I have a private Facebook page, you have a journal, you have unlimited support to me. I am guiding you every step of the way. From day one, 
I am going to tell you exactly what is happening inside your body that night. I'm going to talk to you about detoxification. No, you don't need to go and detox prior to the program because that doesn't make any sense to me because that's what's going to be happening the entire time. So um, all this together and then, you know, on the very first day, we get started and everyone is amazed at what happens wow. and how the body starts to get rid of all those uh, toxins that have been accumulating. Wow. And, and the food is good. That, and, and that <laughs> just leads me to kale, yeah, is good. <laughs> no meat necessary. Such a wonderful, wonderful book. Now, I okay. want you to talk about some of the recipes that you have in here. Well, let me tell you about this, how this came to be. So. Um, after I met a, a lovely young lady, when I came out of the 40 days of Lent and not knowing what I'm doing, and I'm saying, I don't even know what to eat, and I still want to be able to eat. I want a soul food dinner. dinner. What am I going to do? So I went and I um, went to a vegan cooking class, and that's when I had my mm -hmm. aha moments like, oh, remove the bad, replace with the good. So at the time, my daughter was living in South Korea. Uh, no, she's not military, but she was living <laughs> in South Korea, uh, working that is. And um, I would take pictures of the food, and I would send it to her, and she would say, Mom, why don't you, I hope you're writing down these recipes. You never know you might be able to help someone one day. And so I was, over the course of time, I was always putting these recipes together. And when this program came to my mind, I said, oh, I have the recipes. And kale, yeah, because I love kale. kale. <laughs> so, you know, keep me bored a lot right. there. Kale, yeah, is good, no me necessary. So wow. that's how the cookbook came to be. Wow, I yes. tell you. And so all of this really has led to you professionally speaking about all this. You are a TED speaker. Yes. I just, just tell us all about that experience. So I'm sitting in Georgia getting my uh, feet, uh, getting a pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at my phone. And I get this email that says, you know, hi, um, someone has nominated you to be uh, on TED, do a TED talk. And I'm sitting there reading and I'm like, this can't be real, because I know about TEDx. <laughs> I, this can't be real. So um, I responded and true enough, it was the executive producer out of Jacksonville, Florida that says, we have seen footage of you um, and you definitely have a message to spread. You have an idea worth listening to, worth spreading. And so they invited me to come and be wow. a speaker. And what I spoke about um, was no prescription necessary, yes. how within like three months, I'm off of all medication I've ever been on. And to this day, it's been over six years. Wow. Um, the weight has constantly stayed off. I don't worry about anything when it comes to that anymore. Wow. So that's what happened. So it was truly uh, an experience to stand there and talk to 1,500 people uh, about my journey, yes. uh, about becoming a plant-based and all of that. So it was. Absolutely amazing. That is awesome. Absolutely amazing. And so really speaking of vegan, uh, what are some of the challenges and barriers that people have really transitioning to a vegan life? Well, I can speak for myself when you ask that question because um, I didn't do what I do today. I didn't do that to become a vegan. I was trying to save my life. I was at my wit's end. And so um, one of the things that kept me when after the 40 days, um, I didn't know what to do, what to eat, and I was saying to myself, surely I'm not going to be eating fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, and legumes for the rest of my life. I mean, who does that? I'm not going to do this, so, but I was <laughs> right. lost, so what, what do I do? So um, one of the things I thought that that was not going to be any food to eat for me, I'm just going to be eating that. That was a problem. And then, because you hear people say things, I jumped on that bandwagon like, well, where am I going to get my proteins? Where am I going to get my calcium, you know, if I don't do this? You know, it was things like that. So it was a lot of misconception, misconceptions. Even I thought that it was very expensive. And that's, again, because I did not know and I did not understand that the research, that, you, that I was going to be able to still enjoy life. The only difference is my life is better than it mm -hmm. ever have been. And that was a point in my life that that was an impossible. Wow. So that's basically it. Wow, I tell you. So please tell everyone how can they reach you, how can they connect with you, and how can they get oh. both of these books. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I am on Twitter as uh, Dr. Brenda Bradley. Uh, Instagram is Doc Brad, D O C B R A D 67. I'm on Facebook, Dr. Brenda Bradley. Um, you also can go to my website, um, www.drbtbradley.com. That's uh, D R B T B R A D L E Y.com. Awesome. There you go, guys. I tell you, and again, her book, Kel Yeah, It's Good, No Meat Necessary, and I 
feel good. I tell you, I cannot wait to dive into both Thank of these. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You're and welcome. guys, you definitely want to connect with Dr. T. Bradley. Thank you so thank you much for, for this I really, opportunity. Really, really oh, I thank you. <laughs> and I have to tell this, I always do this when I'm at the end, and that is that please always allow food to be your medicine and never your poison. I love that. Never. I love that. So thank, thank you, you so Dr. Bradley. Much. I appreciate Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Guys, thank you so much for joining this interview with Dr. T. Bradley. But guess what? It does not stop. We will, be, we will be back with our next guest. Continue on the health care and self-care with the recharge strategist, Ms. Cherie M. Good. So we'll be right back. He came up against your health. The enemy came up against your finances. The enemy came up against your vision. The enemy came up against your business. You will win. You will win. Yes, you will. none other than Ms. Cherie M. Good. She is the founder and CEO of Total Harmony Enterprises. She is the creator of the annual Recharge Health, Wetness, Wellness, and Fitness Expo. She's a licensed practical nurse for the past 26 years. Number one Amazon best-selling author, speaker, and wellness coach. And she's also an American Heart and Stroke Association ambassador and spokesperson and known as the recharge specialist. <laughs> Woo! 
Yes, recharge <laughs> time. Recharge time. Yeah, recharge time. I tell you, welcome, Sheree. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Oh I'm excited to be God, here with absolutely. you. Absolutely. And so we just finished talking about health care, yes. and now we can't really transition into some self care. Yeah. Because I tell you, if this is not what we need, that's right. So tell <laughs> us a little bit about what you do as the recharge strategist. As the recharge strategist, I teach the importance of self care, mind, body, and spirit. So there's three pieces to this puzzle called wholeness and total harmony and if you're not treating any part of yourself then you can't be whole and so as the recharge strategist you know I teach the importance of not just plugging in your gadgets but plugging in your internal batteries mm. too plugging into yourself and making sure you're doing things to stay well wow that is yeah. awesome I tell you and so you have this actual expo that you yes. do every year and this yes. one coming up it's coming up with <laughs> two months and counting yes. Yes. so tell us about what people can expect if attending this okay so it's totally free to the community you don't have to find a babysitter you bring the entire family wow. for totally free yes I said it free wow. unheard of right so we have a, just a full day geared towards making sure you're taking care of yourself your mind your body and your spirit so we have free health screenings where you can come out and get a glimpse of your wellness how, how well are you you can get free HIV testing hepatitis testing you can find out what you're allergic to we have an allergy company who's wow. gonna come and actually do allergy testing there you can learn free CPR hands only CPR um, also we have power workouts where you can come out in the morning we have three segments a half an hour each you come you work out with us and learn what you need to do to keep yourself together and then in the afternoon we have speakers we have a, a dynamic powerhouse panel who's going to pour into us and make sure we're learning all the information we need to stay healthy wow and i tell you and there's no specific audience right because we no. all need self-care that's exactly. and so one of the things my target audience educators authors entrepreneurs but specifically for educators because we are and everyone in general but mm -hmm. i know as educators that is something yeah. that we talk about self -care. Care. We're so busy really mm -hmm. pouring into others, yes. making sure things are happening right with them, but then it's time for us to take care of ourselves. Exactly. Especially as women. Yes. You know, women, we take care of everybody else, and oftentimes we forget to put ourselves on the calendar. Absolutely. Um, we're taking care of the kids, we're making sure our man's okay, we're running the businesses, we're everything, but we forget that we are the glue to everything around us. Absolutely. So if that glue starts to weaken, we got we got to tighten it up. Wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So tell us what started you on this path. I know that you are a licensed yes. nurse. Uh -huh. Um but take us from the beginning. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> I used to dress up in kindergarten as a nurse, y'all. <laughs> So going on 27 years now, Mayo actually make 27 years I've been a nurse. Wow. Um, so I've always had a passion for just helping people and just learning how the body works and everything. So it, it was just something embedded in me. But as far as becoming the recharge strategist, um, I went through a, a, a really rough divorce after 14 years of marriage. And it left me as an instant single mom. And so can you imagine the stress I was under? I was working a full-time job. I still had my business at that time. And I was just running, and then I became an instant caregiver to my mom when she took ill. And so all these things were just thrown at me instantly, and I was stressed out. Wow. And so I knew that I couldn't be the only one going through that. Absolutely. I'm like, somebody else needs to hear my message and how my tragedy turned to triumph, because we don't stay stuck forever yeah. if we make the necessary steps to take care of ourselves. But um, I went from a size 12 to a size 6 in like two months. Wow. Unhealthy, totally unhealthy. unhealthy. Right. Of course, I wish I could do that now, but um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> maybe I'll have to do the greens, right? I'll right, have to right. do the kale and see if I can do it again. But you know, it was unhealthy. Um, I was feeling depressed. I was laying in bed. I was stuck. And so I had to, you know, do some self-talk. I had to do some self-care mentally, physically, wow. emotionally to heal so that I could be where I am today. And so now I share that message with others. Um, that was the, the background of my, my number one bestseller, okay. The Crash That Altered My Life. Wow. And so now today I look back at that crash and I'm like, wow, you were stuck, but you, you overcame. And so somebody needs hope because we live in a hopeless society. Absolutely. And so I share my message to give hope to people who feel hopeless. Wow. And so what are some things self-care wise that people can do every day just to make sure that they are number one? <laughs> well, moments of stillness. I am a big advocate of just moments of stillness. We always feel like we have to do something. So even when we have nothing to do, like the other day yes. I was sitting on the sofa and I wasn't doing anything. I was just kind of chilling, just laying back. And I'm like, aren't you supposed to be doing something? And I was like, no, your body's telling you, stay still. 
And in moments of stillness, you're able to think about the next best idea. Mm -hmm. you're, you're able to heal. You're able to rejuvenate your mental batteries exactly. <laughs> and your emotional batteries because now you're, you're relaxing. You're appreciating where you are. You appreciate the fact that you're alive. You're breathing. Some, some things so simple as breath we take for granted mm -hmm. every single day that we actually have a pulse. We woke up this morning Absolutely. to get a do-over for whatever we didn't like yesterday, yes. right? So just moments of stillness. Breathing is another one. When you're breathing, you're allowing more oxygen to your brain. You can have clearer thought processes. You're able to make better decisions. Wow. You're able to think your way through problems, whatever may be bothering you. Because we all have junk. We all have stuff. Yes. But if we never just stop and take a moment just to really think about how we could solve some of the issues that's going on and just let go of the things that really don't have an impact on our life the next day, then it has a huge impact on your, on your life. Wow. And so you have a recharge luncheon actually that's coming up too. Talk to us a little bit so about I that. So I do a recharge brunch quarterly for women. Um, one is coming up on March the 4th. Yes. We're going to have 25 women. Um, we get a private dining room at a, at a nice restaurant. We normally do an all-you-can-eat brunch with mimosas. We have fun. So it's a way to provide some self-care. So step away from business. We don't talk about business. We come up with one specific topic. So it's real women, real women, excuse me, robust converse, uh, no, real women, relevant topics, robust conversations. Okay. So we have a special guest each brunch, and we all sit down at almost like a round table, except the tables are square. <laughs> okay. And we just go around and we have these honest-hearted conversations about life. And we don't do that enough. And so you bond with people outside of business. Yes. And then if there's some kind of um, likeness or something, right. then you can do business later. Exactly. But this is a time to just relax, rejuvenate, get away from the kids, get away from the husband, you know, and, and just relax and really provide some self-care because women don't do that enough. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, really speaking in that whole entrepreneurial world, that's mm -hmm. so true because yes. when we go, we're thinking networking <laughs> and that thing, you know. We can connect, yeah. but like you said, mm -hmm. all of the business can take place at a later date. <laughs> yeah, my, my sister recently had a um, an event and she said, okay, I'm going to give everybody two minutes. Yes. And you can tell everybody about yourself, but you can't say anything about business. Yes. And so many people were stuck. Like, we forget. Yes, we are our businesses, but yes. we're somebody outside of that. Exactly. Like, you're a mom, you're a wife. You, you know, what are the things you really enjoy doing outside of your business? Exactly. And so that's a part of performing self-care, making sure mentally you're, you're well, making sure you're exercising, making sure you're mm. eating those nutritious meals that's going to keep you energized, rejuvenated, recharged throughout the day, wow. and not having all that sugar in your system where you're on a quick rise and then you crash <laughs> wow. like a crash dummy, you know? <laughs> and then emotionally, you know, who are you? Are you really in touch with what makes you tick? Wow. Wow. So mm -hmm. how, so do you work with one-on-one individuals or a group? Like, how do you service your clients? I do both. Okay. I do one-on-one, -on -one, um, but I also do group. Um, we do, like, a 90-day group um, calls, okay. and, and also everything's virtual. Okay. So, you know, I've had clients all over the world. So I don't want to limit myself to just Absolutely. one area because stress and self-care affects all ethnicities, all areas. Um, so we do virtual trainings. Okay. And that's group. If you want one-on-one, -on -one, then we design a specific uh, program just for you. Okay. And you, yeah. you spoke on stress. Yes. Um, that's really huge. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times people don't know that it's stress that's affecting them negatively. Yes. Um, how, what, what are some signs that, you know, hey, you may be a little stressed? Right. Well, stress is a silent killer it's like dumping a poison slowly through your system and so you can have um, things like headaches you could be having anxiety attacks um, you could actually be sleeping too much or sleeping or not mm. sleeping enough um, you may be gaining or losing weight wow. so stress you can see where it's silent yes. because it could also be signs of other things wow. but um, as you had mentioned earlier I am an ambassador and spokesperson for the American Heart Association every 80 seconds a woman dies from heart disease it, it, that is like crazy to me. Yes. Every 80 seconds. Wow. And we've been on here a couple minutes, so right. that means a couple people have lost their lives mm. from heart disease, from ineffectively managing their self-care, wow. ineffectively managing their stress, not getting in the know about their numbers, their cholesterol, their blood sugar, just not really taking moments of stillness, not recharging their internal batteries, but we make sure that our gadgets are charged up because we wouldn't dare yes. think of letting our gadgets That's go right. down to 10, 15%, <laughs> That's right? right? You get that warning, you have 10% left, we're running to Starbucks, exactly. McDonald's, we're borrowing plugs, we don't care what we have to do, we make sure that our gadgets are charged up, but we'll let ourselves go down to, to E. Wow. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so how can individuals reach out to Cherie M. Good for <laughs> recharging? <laughs> well, my website is TotalHarmonyEnterprises.com. 
on social media, all your social media platforms. I'm Cherie M. Good and also at Recharge Expo on Twitter wow. and on Instagram. Wow. So I'm easy to find or just yes. Google me. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. And so what would be your lasting message um, to those out there that definitely need to put self-care on the top of their list? There is a huge stigma that self-care is selfishness. Self-care is not selfishness. Self-care is a necessity, not an option. Wow. I love that. I love that. I tell you guys, <laughs> healthcare, self-care, that's what it's all about. And you have heard it today from my guest, Cherie M. Good. So definitely connect with her if you are in need of some recharge. And so, Cherie, thank you thank so much. Thank you for having me. I much. appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Such valuable information. Yes, Absolutely. Yes. So, guys, we are going to be back with our next guest, Mr. Curtis Valentine. Hello? Hey, girl. Oh, what's wrong? Girl, I just went to a major dealership and got ripped off on a luxury car. Oh, well, I just got a great deal on a luxury car at Star Imports in Camp Springs, Maryland. They took their time with me, treated me with respect, and helped me find a perfect car. Hey, DMV, looking for a unique car buying experience? Tired of high-pressure sales? Good news at Star Imports. You'll be delighted with our boutique-style car buying experience. We're committed to treating you with the utmost respect, even if you have less than perfect credit. Check out our impressive selection of pre-owned BMWs, Mercedes-Benz, Lexus, Jaguars, and other imports starting at $5,988. For fast online guaranteed credit approvals, go to starimports.com. That's S-T-A-R-R-I-M-P-O-R-T-S dot com. Or call 301-423-8000. Star Imports, home of the boutique style car buying experience. Located in Camp Springs, Maryland. Off exit 7B off the Beltway. Next to Red Lobster. Curtis Valentine. He is currently an at-large member of the Prince George's County Public School Board of Education. He serves as chair of the Policy, Legal, and Legislative Committee. He is the founder of the Male Educator Network of PGCPS, 
men of Prince George's County Public Schools and their Real Men Teach campaign. And if you follow him or know him, you know he is a proud graduate of Morehouse College. <laughs> and also Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Mr. Valentine, welcome to the I Am Dr. Sharon Show. I'm glad to finally be here. I've <laughs> yes. always watched the show. I said, well, one day maybe I'll become a guest. I, maybe I'll do something worthy of, of being a guest, so hopefully I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. I am so glad. You know, I just, first of all, have to say thank you for your efforts with the Male Educators Campaign. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. I, I, I come from uh, the classroom. I taught middle school here in Prince George's County, and um, I, you know, I'm a parent, and so I understand the importance of, of men in our school system. And this is a personal, you know, uh, testimony for the experience I've had and the improvements uh, that I believe men have in our school system if they're engaged. Wow! And I tell you, it has really taken steam. I, I remember the first time it started, you know, and now it's like it's really a proud bond of the male educators in our school district. It is, and it's taking, you know, and it's sort of taking hold, uh, I think, outside of our area as well. And Absolutely. so we have folks from D.C., Northern Virginia, Baltimore, but also when we post our pictures and our events to social media and other male educators around the country are saying, how can we have a similar network of young men educators in Chicago, wow. in New York, wow. in Atlanta, in Miami, because we have a good, you know, a good cadre of male educators here but there's a deficit in other parts of the country, unfortunately. Absolutely. So tell us why it's important that the push for male educators is present now. Well, the data is clear around the, the, the effect of male educators on student achievement, on it's just student culture, school culture. I think traditionally male educators, particularly male educators of color, were brought on as disciplinarians. Mm. And sort of, you know, we'll go see Mr. Johnson, and Mr. Johnson will come in and take you away. But mm. I think the data over time has shown that when you have someone in front of the classroom who looks like you, particularly for male students, mm -hmm. that it impacts your ability to sort of push a little further, to see yourself and see someone who's uh, valuing education well. Similarly for young girls, to have a positive role model, um, especially in a county like ours, unfortunately, we have a, a large number of our students who are coming from uh, fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. And so when you have men who are trying to dispel the uh, negative um, impressions you have of men and create positive images, it impacts student achievement, it, it attracts your identity, it, it, it really improves your ability to, to dream big uh, and to persevere like we've done generation after generation. Wow, and you know as a former principal I can really attest to the lack of males in a building. It would be nothing to only have three, two mm -hmm. or three mm -hmm. male teachers in the mm -hmm. classroom. Mm -hmm. And that is detrimental to our students. I would agree. I mean, it, it creates an, an imbalance. I think traditionally, you know, coming out of, you know, the 60s and 70s, uh, you had this, you know, great push towards women in education. Um, and what I say is, you know, what the Male Education Network does is we don't simply celebrate men. I think what we try to do is support men so they can take the burden off all the women who've done yes. so much. And so, <laughs> yes. and so, you know, where is the Women Educator Network? I said, you know, um, the, the benefit of this is that, again, we are bringing men back into the classroom, into the school building, holding them accountable for taking the burden off of women who've had to be both mothers, educators, also, you know, spearhead the PTA, you know, you all also are leaders in the church. Yes. You are leaders politically, as leaders politically, as you see in places like Alabama mm -hmm. recently, and so particularly women of color. If the brothers would just step back up, um, wow. take their responsibility, and don't say take over, mm -hmm. but just create the balance that I think we need in order to get you know get ahead. Exactly. And so you have a conference that's coming up. Yes. The Talk to us about that. Yeah, the Finding Manhood Conference um, this Saturday uh, at Oxon Hill High School. Uh, we've done it before, but there's a renewed energy around this because we for the first time presented on our model at a national male educator conference in Philadelphia. Yes. Um, a group of brothers there in Philadelphia Public Schools called The Fellowship yes. put together a national conference. We presented, we were engaged with other male educators from around the country, and we said, you know, we want to come back and do our conference a little bit different. Mm. Uh, and so this year will be a little bit different from last year. We're going to have a sort of a, a, a TED Talk model where we're going to have five educators answer five key questions in education at the beginning of the conference. Uh, we're going to do workshops that are going to be led by male educators, and then we're going to have a, an empowerment brunch where we're going to have a, 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 a very powerful motivational speaker is going to really invigorate us to take what we've learned at the conference and apply it to 
our schools, but also our, our community here in Prince George's County and also around the region because we're inviting men from all wow. over the DMV to come. Wow, that is just going to be exciting. How can, is it too late to get tickets? How can people no, get No, no, it's not. That? And so uh, we have a link to our registration um, actually on um, our Facebook page, on my page. You can also inbox me on social media or on um, Twitter, Instagram, where you can email me and I can send you the link. Uh, registration uh, will be closing soon. We've, you know, we said the first folk, the first 50 who register um, will get free T-shirts, uh, and then everyone subsequently after that will, uh, again, will get you know free lunch, you know, um, a seat at the table, opportunity to network with other educators, and really become part of a conversation where uh, you understand that you're not just an educator, uh, you're a leader in your community, you're a leader in your school building, and the young people who you teach now. Um, they may not appreciate you now, yeah, but everyone right. that I've spoken to, everyone I know, can remember that one teacher in their life yes. who, if that teacher's not coming to their life, they wouldn't be where they were. And if you're that, that teacher for that child, uh, then your, your legacy uh, is, is, is solid. So being in education right now is a great time to be here, but this conference is just one way to empower our male educators to go out and be, be change makers. Wow. And, and I want to really transition to your work with the whole PGCC Prince George's Community College Pipeline to Morehouse. Oh, yeah, I okay. I love that. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you are this. so, at, and I absolutely love the love that you have for Morehouse. Mm -hmm. You know, that pride, that HBCU pride, that Morehouse pride. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to us about your efforts in really helping these individuals who have plans to go to your alma mater. Well, it's funny. I mean, the male conference and the Morehouse connection are, are to me, are, are one and the same. When I think about what's needed in our community, um, where we are today nationally, is men of color stepping up and taking leadership roles. Uh, and so Morehouse being the only institution of its kind in the world where you have men of color being trained in a unique environment created just for them, uh, we need more men in Morehouse, not less. Mm -hmm. And we need Morehouse reaching out to young men who may not have started off on a path to Morehouse mm -hmm. and they have had an environment that really supported them to go to Morehouse and eventually ended up at community college. Um, I'm a professor there, and so when I'm in the classroom or when I'm a mentor with the Diverse Male Student Initiative, I would meet these young men, and I would say, you're a Morehouse man. And someone <laughs> would say, what's, what's Morehouse? <laughs> and I would show them a video, or I'd talk about it, um, and through our program, we take students from Prince George to Morehouse, and we let them walk around campus. Wow. And they just blend in because no one knows they're not students. And invariably, after those three or four days, they come back, and they're literally, uh, their eyes are just wow. opened up. Wow, I was at lunch table. And I was overhearing young men talk about interning at Google and going studying abroad in London and you know getting jobs on Wall Street or starting your own small business, your own nonprofit. And when you're around men who are talking like that, uh, it invariably will take off the limits you put on yourself and say, "Why can't I work at Google? Absolutely. Why can't I work at Yahoo? Why can't I? Why can't I start my own business? Why can't I write my own book? Why have to wait until I'm 30 to buy a home exactly. and, 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 and start a, a, a you know entrepreneurship?" And so what the community college does is say, "You know what?" These young men um, may not be ready for Morehouse now, but let's mentoring through the process, help them with the application, help them with their GPA, with their, with their standardized test scores, and then prepare them into a Morehouse. Once they do enter, then we, then we support them through the process. Wow. So we have a bi-weekly call with the students who are at Morehouse from the community college, and we say, hey, how are things going? You know, schoolwork-wise, relationship-wise, job-wise, scholarship. Yeah. It's a very, you know, it's a, it's a conference call with about six or seven of us on the call. Wow. And so uh, that conversation for us is, a, is a not just get into college, mm -hmm. but get out of college because um, only half of the students who enter college actually graduate on time. Wow. And so that's, I think, um, why I'm so excited about it. Also because of my own personal story. My parents didn't, didn't go to college. Um, and at the cost of college right now, if I was a student, um, right now, I couldn't have afforded, I wouldn't have had an example of Morehouse. And so when I see these students, I see myself as well. And so this is a personal to me, but it's also practical because I'm interested in making sure HBCUs stay alive. Wow, that, I mean, it, it's just really unbelievable because not only um, is your effort with male educators, with Morehouse, but also just the whole fatherhood and family structure. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about that because you really demonstrate the true meaning of a family structure. Well, again, I, you know, when I think about uh, our community, I mean, you have school, you have church, and you have um, the home. And again, in our county, if you look at the data, both in predominantly black communities, but also in Prince George's County, the number of female-headed households, just based on census data, um, is as, you know, 
at the minimum 50% in some schools and other upwards maybe 80%. And so you think about my experience, you know, my father, um, I, I, my father and I were connected very strongly up until his, his passing a year ago. Um, and my mother would still be married. They've been married over, over 30 some odd years. But his impact on my life, but also the impact of my friend's fathers, mm -hmm. who I couldn't go anywhere in my little town in New Jersey without a man pulling me by the shoulder and say, Curtis, how you doing in school? Where are you going to college? You know, what's your GPA? I mean, literally on a daily, I couldn't escape it. Wow. And so when I came to Prince George's County, one of the first thing I said when I started on the, on the school board was, you know, where's our parental engagement at? Oh, you know, we have a strong, and everywhere I go, there'd be women. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong, doing great. <laughs> I said, where are the brothers? Where are the fathers? <laughs> oh, they don't come. Oh, I said, you know, okay, well, how do we bring them in to, again, um, make that connection? And so we started doing social events. So we said, you know, let's just, let's kind of bring the fathers in and, and that's way. And so we would do father-daughter dances mm -hmm. where you saw folks doing donuts with dads. Uh, and then, okay, if we can bring them in here, then we can start having conversations around parenting. So how do you parent a child in this age of social media? Mm -hmm. Does your child have a phone? Uh, how are you dealing with dating? How are you dealing with online bullying? Um, and then we start getting into other competitions around how do you speak to your wife? How do you speak to your wow. significant other? Does that impact the way your daughter sees herself or your son sees his potential mate? Do we have a responsibility as men to hold each other accountable when we see a man talking a certain way about a woman in front of children or one another? Do we give, um, um, you know, do we give protection to men who we know are doing, you know, so mm -hmm. these are all the things that I think you know, in my in my vision for our county and for our country, if we had men, particularly men of color, in the school system, at home, stepping up, being positive examples, um, we can do anything. And so, in addition to having our conference this Saturday, uh, we have a father-daughter dance yeah. uh, in in March um, at Largo High School. Um, last year, we sold out. Wow. We didn't have enough space, um, and again, it's a sort of a first one, first come first serve. Over four hundred uh, young girls came. Wow. Um, and we start, and, and this, this, this is the really interesting part. When we, when we closed off the registration and we said we were closed, we started getting phone calls, not from the fathers, from the mothers. Wow. And they would say, you know, Mr. Valentine, I know you said it was closed, <laughs> but my daughter bought a, bought a dress, and my husband bought a new suit, and, wow. you know, we really want to go, and I'm really looking forward to it. Or, you know, I'm separated from my significant other or my, my, my child's father. He lives in another state. He's going to come in oh, town. Man so he could s take his daughter wow. to this daddy daughter dance. You get, you get emotional about yes. it. Wow, this is something <laughs> these young girls I wouldn't, would never forget because we don't want the first time you have a, a connection with a young man to be prom night. Exactly. We want you to be able to say, no, my father taught me very early. You come to the door. You know, you hold, you hold the door for me. You ask me what I want to drink. Mm. You hold my chair. I don't have to wonder about this. I know it because I expect it. Wow. And I expect it from you that holds the young men more accountable. Exactly. Hold up, I'm with a young lady who don't take no mess. So I'm going to get, I'm going to step my game up because as a husband and a, and, a, and a man, unfortunately, a lot of time we just do what you all expect of us. <laughs> like, hold up, so are you good with this? I'm good with it. <laughs> but when you say no, I, you know, this is what I expect. You will invariably lift the, you know, lift wow. that up as men. And so, the fathers, Morehouse, male educators, this is all part of yes. uh, a, 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 a vision I have. For, for men, just, just just step up. I'm not sure to do more than women are doing. Mm -hmm. Just do what they've been doing. <laughs> exactly. and, if you, and then you realize, oh, y'all were doing all that. Yes. You were doing, oh, Jesus, I don't know. Thank yes. you. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. And so that's, that's, that's all. And, and the response, as you can see, is incredibly positive. Uh, the brothers are keep coming back. Um, you know, this year, we're gonna, our, 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 our father-daughter dance, we're going to add a little bit extra this year um, with, with some of our... Um, our, our, you know, some secrets that I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll share on social media eventually again this year with our Mill Educator Network conference. Just trying to do a little bit different every year to make sure it's attractive to people. That's awesome. And what age group is the father-daughter dance? It's elementary school. Okay. And so it's, you know, it's kindergarten through sixth. Uh, we tried to do a middle school and, you know, it was a little bit more difficult, you know, and even high school because I think once you get to that middle school, the father-daughter relationship is sort of cemented. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's almost too late, unfortunately. Okay. But when you get them at that third, fourth, my daughter is a, is a second grader, they're still pulling on dad's, you know, yes, jacket. Absolutely. And you can hook them there by the time in their middle school, they'll still be daddy's girl. But when you lose them from different, you know, in that elementary, and you try to come jump back in in the middle, and they're going through a lot of puberty and identity, things like that, it's harder. And so yes. we pull them elementary, 
And again, we've done such a good job of advertising that we um, we sold out, and I, I expect us to do that the same this year. That is awesome. So I absolutely applaud your effort um, for all the work you do for the male educators, for the fathers, families, and even for your work at your beloved Morehouse. Thank you very much. <laughs> because you really inspire others to really get connected with their alumni associate, and that's really what it's all about. And yeah, so, you have to. I mean, I mean, historically black colleges are the foundation of our, of our school system. I yes. mean, the majority of our teachers in our system are HBCU alums. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have public school educators. Absolutely. And so, um, if you're an HBCU alum, donate to your college today, Absolutely. send $5, send $10, uh, and demonstrate that you go out to see Black Panther and, and, wear, and wear your, you know, your <laughs> African garb and, you know, yay Wakanda and all that stuff. <laughs> but when you come home, drop $5, Absolutely. drop $12, drop $20 in the HBCU. Um, alum and, and and see what happens if we can do that we can do anything absolutely I love it I tell you I thank you so much Curtis Valentine for being a part of this show thank and you. sharing all your wonderful work well, thank you for inviting me I've made it I've, since, I, since I've, I've been on the Sharon Porter show I've made it I can call my mother I say you know what yes. mom you know, I have made it. I was invited on the show. I watch Sunday mornings, and now I'm here, so I yes, appreciate it. I appreciate you. Well thank done, you. they said. I'm, well done. Thank you so <laughs> much, guys. And thank you for joining my interview with Curtis Valentine. Definitely reach out to him if you would like to support or even know more about all of his initiatives for the male educators as well as the Fatherhood Forum. So, again, thank you, Curtis, and I am so excited for you. Thank you very much. So, guys, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll have our final guest, Keeping on with the educational theme, Miss Amity Pope. Dr. Sharon show. My guest is Miss Amity Pope. Amity, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So Amity is native to Prince George's County Public Schools. She is a product of this school district in Maryland, Prince George's County, and she currently serves as a mentor teacher in the district. She is a social justice act activist, and she is currently pursuing her doctoral degree at Walden University. Go Walden. That's Yay. my alum. <laughs> and she is currently a candidate for Prince George's County Education Association President. Amity, welcome to the I Am Dr. Sharon Show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I totally appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, I love my educators. <laughs> yes. And so I am just so really excited to hear that you are running for president of PGCEA. <laughs> Why are you running for PGCEA president? So interestingly enough, I love what I do as a mentor teacher. I like to say I have the best job in Prince George's County Public Schools um, as we work together in the <laughs> yes. same office. And I love to say I have the best job and it, what I'm able to do. But as a native of the school district and being a listener for my members, I won't say my members, my educator peers um, that are members, we are members of the same association, listening to them um, 
day after day, year after year, when I visit schools and work with teachers on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. hearing that their concerns aren't really um, making the difference for them wow. um, has weighed on me. So I said, <laughs> you know, they say, Amity, you are a social justice advocate. You are a change agent. You espouse to make the difference. And so I said to myself, well, what better way to do that in small pockets, mm -hmm. classroom to classroom, school to school, why not find a way to empower all educators and have this association, the way it's created, actually function wow. in that way. So wow. that's why I, I took on and took on the, the, the run for our candidacy. Wow, that is awesome. And so as president, mm -hmm. what things would you put in place that's really different than what's happening now, currently? So one of the things, um, I've been having a couple conversations with a couple delegates around uh, thinking innovatively and creatively around um, securing salary, uh, step increases. I myself am four steps behind. Wow. And um, while I don't have children, I have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I have a mortgage, right? You know, it's um, it's shocking how many educators work two and three jobs. So making the salary increase is mm. one of my major concerns, and thinking innovatively around perhaps using solar energy to divert extra funds for those step increases. Um, having those types of creative conversations is something that I would put in place. Um, amongst others. Okay, that's really interesting. And so for those of us, because of course we are streaming live and there are school districts who don't have associations. So can you explain mm -hmm. a little bit about really what the Education Association for Teachers really is and do for our school district? So our PGCEA, the association, is a government, uh, democratic governed body by the members for the members. And one of the things that we do, and um, we are hopeful that we're able to continue in this manner with we have the Supreme Court cases coming up on the 26th of this month, um, Janice, that may irreversibly um, affect working conditions, or the, the ability to collectively bargain for working conditions, um, pay, and environment um, of such. The association is the organization that's designed specifically to address those matters that are of interest and importance to educators. Yes. And being able to do that and create a structure so that this member-driven organization does just that, I see will alleviate and begin to alleviate mm -hmm. over time um, the, the social ills that our teachers, not only not only do our students experience trauma, traumatic experiences exactly. and have past experiences of such, but our educators are dealing with some of those same Absolutely. social ills. And so that's what the association Absolutely. is designed to do. And you know, um, this week, of course, the last week we had the tragedy in Parkland, Florida. Mm -hmm. And one of your pushes is for really a transformation of how we use our school resource officers. Yes. Um, and really the law and, and just the security in general in schools. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's part of your platform. That is. So my, um, my ideology is that school security and equipment will not make schools safe. Um, we have a restorative practices coordinator that was just uh, implemented last year in our school district. And through those practices, along with, I believe, school resource officers should have the should partake in de-escalation training, mm -hmm. um, cognitive social behavior training, things that educators had to take um, to become credentialed and to receive their, their license to teach and practice um, are, are some of the really key things because our demographics are a lot different yes. from the horrific tragedies that have been happening mm -hmm. um, since 2018. Mm -hmm. I think there's been 46 mm -hmm. tragedies, I, don't quote me on the number, but there's been way too many tragedies with school shootings. And um, you know, while our socioeconomic and our demographics are mm -hmm. different, um, the need for more security with the, the notion that 
students and teachers and community members that see more police officers yeah. or school resource officers and buildings make it safe, it actually does uh, the, the direct opposite. Mm -hmm. it, it reminds them of uh, valid uh, past situations that they've had with the law or their families have mm -hmm. had with the law. And so there has to be a conversation. They can't, ju you know, just um, implementing individuals into the buildings without a conversation with students mm -hmm. to, to see that um, the school resource officers are there to uh, support, but there has to be a conversation yes. around how that implementation really works so that the trigger in, that happens with students Absolutely. and teachers. And teachers, yes. And administrators. <laughs> Absolutely. <you know>. Absolutely. <laughs> and so who is voting um, in this election? Is it all teachers or just teachers that are part of the association? Teachers that are part of the association, so PGCEA Unit 1 employees, that includes classroom teachers, counselors, PPWs, okay. school psychologists. Awesome. So how can people support you in your effort um, to achieve this presidency for PGCEA? They can vote. <laughs> so that's <laughs> number one. <laughs> the email has hit the inboxes, both personal and um, our PGCPF email okay. account. And um, it's through MSEA. It's all online. And they just open up that, okay. that link copy and paste their MSEA ID number into the ballot, wow. the electronic ballot, and vote. Wow. And, um, and I say, if you believe like I believe, a vote for me is a vote for you. That is awesome, I tell you. And so those of us who are not in the association and maybe are really you know, pushing you for that, how can those of us support you in that effort as well? You can share your story with other people, other educators, um, how I've been helpful <laughs> and okay. what differences I've made uh, for schools and my trainings um, and uh, everyday support. You can share how that difference has made an, an everlasting and you know, positive mm -hmm. impact. Yes, absolutely. So tell everyone when the election is and tell them exactly what they need to do. <laughs> so the election has started. <laughs> And you can go to your inbox, click on the MSEA, it's from PGCEA, the email's from PGCEA. Click on the link to go to vote, copy and paste your MSEA number that's embedded in the link that's associated with you, and click Amity Pope for president. There you go, there you have it, Pope for president. <laughs> I definitely um, wish you nothing but success Thank in you. your run for president. I think you will make an awesome president for the PGCEA, just your love and your, your, your passion for doing what's right. And so I, I definitely wish you much success in your run. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank so you. guys, if you are it. a part of PGCEA and you are Team Pope, definitely vote. Um, if she said it's by email, so just open up that email and vote for Amity Pope. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Amity, thank for being you. a part. Thank Absolutely. You, and guys, thank you so much for joining another episode of the I Am Dr. Sharon Show. I am Dr. Sharon H. Porter, always reminding you, the bigger the dream, the harder the grind. Mm -hmm. Push, pray, and continue to grind. Enemy came up against your finances. The enemy came up against your vision. The enemy came up against your business. You will win.